Hi, this is Jeff Spencer, Math 120 instructor for the Community College of Denver, and this is our video lecture over Section 3.2, where we continue the logic uh, logic chapter. So now we're going to take statements and compound them and do connectives. So that's what we're looking at today, compound statements and connectives. So here are our objectives. We're going to work with symbolic form and English translating back and forth. We're actually not going to do objective three. So Simple and compound statements. So simple statements convey one idea with no connecting words. Compound statements combine two or more simple statements using connectives. Connectives are, you, are words used to join simple statements. Remember, simple statements are things that can be evaluated to be true or false. Uh, we went over that in 3.1. So the connectives are words like and, or, if then, and if and only if. These are the four connectives that we're going to look at in 3.2. So and statements is what we start with. If P and Q are two simple statements, then the compound statement P and Q is symbolized by P and then like basically an upside down V, uh, Q. This compound statement formed by connecting statements with the word and is called a conjunction. The symbol for and is this upside down V. Okay, so a conjunction basically means and it's symbolized by this. So it says, let P and Q represent the following simple statements. P, it is after 5 p.m. Q, they are working. Write each compound statement below in symbolic form. So sometimes we'll be going from English to symbolic form. This is an example of that. So it says, it's after 5 p.m. and they are working. So that's just P and Q. P upside down V, Q. Uh, the next statement says, it is after 5 p.m. and they are not working. Now remember, that's a negation of Q. So we're going to have a negation in front of Q. It has the and symbol, and then it has a statement P. So we have P and not Q. Okay. So other expressions, English expressions for the word and. Um, it's all the same symbolic stuff, but sometimes we'll see, um, instead of P and Q, we'll see P but Q. So here's like just this, the same example of it is after 5 p.m. and they are working. Um, all these things may mean the same thing. So we could use the word P but Q or uh, P yet Q. Yet is another way of saying and. Or nevertheless is another way of kind of saying and. The connective or can mean two different things. So we d went over the and connective. Now we're working over the, the connective or. Um, it says that it can mean two different things. It says, I visited London or Paris. This statement can mean an exclusive or, I visited London or Paris, but not both. It can also mean the inclusive or. Just to be clear, I want to be very clear, for, for us in this chapter and for the rest of our class, or will always mean the inclusive or. It could mean that you did both. All right, just keep that in mind. We're never, ever going to use the exclusive or. We're always going to mean that it could mean both. Or always gives the possibility that you could do both. So it's like, think of if, if you um, have a prerequisite for a particular major, they say you can take physics or chemistry. Well, they'll definitely allow you to take physics and chemistry, take both physics and chemistry, and you'll still be able to go on to that major. So we're always going to be working with the inclusive or, which could leave the possibility of both. So we call the or statements the, uh, a disjunction, and we use the symbol uh, just a V. So it's a compound statement uh, for the inclusive or used by the symbol V here. Thus, P or Q or both is symbolized by P, uh, P, V, Q. Now, I'm, every time I see this, though, in the future, I'm just going to say or. All right, so we're going to translate from English to symbolic form. There we go. Okay, I was wondering if the thing will show up. It says, let P and Q represent the following simple statements. <coughs> Excuse me. It says... The bill receives majority approval. The bill becomes law. So write each compound statement below in symbolic form. So it says the bill resort receives majority approval or the bill becomes law. So that's just P or Q. The next one says the bill receives majority approval or the bill does not become law. So that is a negation of the second statement. That's why we have the negation here, P or not Q. All right, so then we have if-then statements. So we've had and statements, which are conjunctions, or statements, which are disjunctions, and then we have if-then statements, which are called conditional statements. Um, this compound statement, if P, then Q, is symbolized by 
if by p arrow q got to remember it's if p then q so really the arrow kind of just means then and it's implied that there's an if in front of p okay so keep that in mind just think that the arrow means p then q so if p then q this is called the conditional statement the statement before the arrow is called the antecedent and the statement after the arrow is called the consequent Another way to think about if-then statements is uh, as a subset, like we saw in chapter two, when we have one set that's entirely contained within another set, we know that that's a subset. So if we say things like this is a quantified statement, like we said in 3.1, all poets are writers, that's one way of saying it. Or we could say poets is a subset of writers. Um, the other thing is we, you know, the, the other way of saying all poets are writers is saying there are no poets that are not writers. That's not a very typical way of saying it, but it's, it means the same thing. And then, uh, a quantified statement like this is the same as a conditional statement. If the person is a poet, then that person is a writer. That basically means that as poets, that group is a subset of the set of writers. So just keep that in mind. If we have an if then it's like a subset. Okay, translating from English to symbolic form. So we're doing the same thing with if-then statements. Let's say we have the statement, a person is a father, and the second statement, a person is a male. It says, reach, write each compound statement below in symbolic form. So if a person is a father, then that person is a male. So this is just going to be P arrow Q. Next one, it says, if, oh, I don't know where example B went, but okay, either way says, if a person is not a male, <clears throat> then that person is not a father. So it's a neg we start with the negation of Q. So if a person is not a male, and then, then arrow, that person is not a father, the negation of P. So it's going to be not Q, arrow, not P. All right, so other, other ways of saying uh, the same thing of if P, then Q. Um, it, there's a bunch of different ways of saying the same thing. Um, I would say most often we're going to see generally the first three. If we see the language uh, that's going to be common in our uh, homework and exams. Um, just remember that there's different ways to say these same things and we're just showing equivalencies here. So if P then Q, there's a, not, there's a bunch of different ways of saying it. I do like the sufficient. Being a father is sufficient for being a male. So if you're a father, that's enough information to know that you are then a male. Okay, so this table will be available. Not the most important thing of the section, but just understand that it's not. we're not always just going to say if then. Sometimes we'll use different wordings. The last... Uh, can, uh, the last compound statement is a uh, if and only if. So a bicondi we call it a biconditional. The last one was a conditional. This is called a biconditional. And biconditional statements are conditional statements that are true if the statement is still true and the antecedent and the con consequent are reversed. So if a person is a father, then that person is a male. Well, if we flip it around and say if that person is a male, then that person is a father. Well, that's not necessarily true. So we say if a person is an unmarried male, then that person is a bachelor. If a person is a bachelor, then that person is an unmarried male. Those are the same way, you know, those are two things that are saying the same thing. So we sometimes have compound statements and we use the term if and only if. P, if and only if Q. And we use the symbol a double arrow to represent that we need both statements for those things to be true. Sometimes we'll see, we won't mess with the language too much on this. We'll keep it pretty simple that uh, we'll just generally use if and only if. Uh, and since what they're showing here is that it's the same statement when you reverse the P and the Q. So that doesn't really matter the order on, um, on biconditionals. And then we also have necessary and sufficient, which is sometimes you might see that, but we will probably won't use it a lot. So this is just a bunch of different ways of saying the same thing. Feel free to pause it at, at this at this screen and read up on these. But it's not once again these last two slides here. This one and this one are not the most important thing. 
we will sometimes use different language, but with if and only if, biconditionals, that's generally what we use, if and only if. So just to go over what we've, uh, all the um, different symbols and things that we've worked with so far, we have a negation symbol, which is a squiggly, and then we have a conjunction, which is an and statement, P and Q. Different, here are the common translations. These are the ones that we're probably going to use most typically. We have a disjunction, which is or. We have a conditional, which is like your if-then statement, if P, then Q, or P is sufficient for Q. Um, and then biconditional, if and only if statement. And those are all the symbols. So this is a real important one to have and remember. All right, so then we're going to practice uh, going from symbolic to English. So let's see here. It says P and Q represent the following simple statements. She is wealthy. She is happy. Reach, write each of the following symbolic statement in words. So first we have the ne negation of she is wealthy and she is happy. So this is this inside part is she is wealthy and she is happy. And we're saying she is the negation of that. So that means it is not true that she is wealthy and happy. She's not this and this. All right, next we have negation of P and Q. So we could say she is not wealthy and she is happy. Then we have the last one here where we have the negation of the, the disjunction. So this is she is she is the inside part is she is wealthy or she is happy. So here, when we say a negation of an or statement, then you then you say she is neither wealthy nor happy. She is neither wealthy nor happy. All right, so that's basically, I would say the biggest slide that you need to remember is this one here. You need to understand all the symbols for the different types of uh, um, conjunction, disjunction, conditional, and biconditional, and just understand how to translate some basic ones. I think a, another useful thing to, to keep in mind is with if-then statements, which are really popular, that it's really this representing a subset situation. So keep those two in mind. Good luck. We'll see you next time.